He was an ordinary boy. He was 13, quite small for his age. He was caught in the middle of what they call that awkward age. He had his hopes and dreams, but they were never told, so they were never heard. He came from Bethnal Green, where ambition was a dirty word. His father could never have been described as the talkative sort. The boy found it hard to compete with beer and televised sport. But when he sat with his dad and watched the tennis on ESPN, the boy saw the girl and nothing was the same again. She was no ordinary girl. She was 14, came from Peru. It was the year that she first made it into the top 32. She had reached the last 16 of the Stella Artois. Someone in the press called her the new Konnikova. She had remarkable stamina and levels of concentration for one so young. She had a double-handed backhand which had proved to be particularly strong. But if there was one compelling reason why she had made her name, it was that she had the second fastest serve in the women's game. The boy had fallen in love with the girl right from the very start. She did this backhand slice which damn near broke his heart. She played her first Grand Slam. It was a French Open. And for the first time now, she was playing Wimbledon. His heart had filled with hope, but then it quickly ebbed away. SW19 may as well have been a universe away. But then he saw the advert and his passion was refired. It was from the All England Club that said, Ball boys required. It was luck of the draw, a ballot system. Those were the rules. But they also had a quota to fill from poorer London schools. And so one morning the doorbell rang as he watched Spongebob and ate his Cocoa Pops. And he found himself signing for a package containing a green polo top. The girl arrived in London. She was seeing it for the very first time. The home of Madame Tussauds, the Tate Modern, the Dungeons, the London Eye. There was no visit to Legoland or We Will Rock You for her, of course. She was spending 10 hours a day working a week forehand on the practice courts. She was staying in the Dorchester, five star. She'd flown first class. She had lucrative sponsorship deals with Donny, Nike and Adidas. She ate her breakfast watching Spongebob in the best rooms all over the world. But eating those Cocoa Pops in that toweling gown was just a lonely 14 year old girl. The boy was nervous as he gingerly tried on his new green shorts. 
was a newbie, would they put him on one of the outside courts? He scanned the rotor pinned up in the Old England Club corridor. The court that he had been allocated was number four. She was 200 yards away. She was on court number two. She was 6-5 up in the third set on a serve nearly through. She was all over the place though, mistiming shots. She'd lost her nerve. She was having to work off a considerably weaker second serve. In that whole first week, she served not even a single ace. She somehow struggled through though, to her last 16 place. In Grand Slam terms though, it was further than she'd ever been before. And the venue for her next match, court number four. And so a dream came true for the boy on that bright June day. The girl that he'd laid down his life for was inches away. Was it a dream though? Or was it actually his worst nightmare? The number one rule was, don't talk to the player. And for the girl too, it also looked like the dream was going sour. It looked like her match wouldn't even last the hour. The second fastest serve in the game could barely pass the net. Now, she was 5-2 down in the second set. He sat, crouched by the net, like a coiled spring, holding the ball. But all he could do was watch as she gave her all. Yet another first serve misfired and sliced straight into the net. His heart was heavy, her eyes were wet. She dinked a weak first serve, she just wanted to get it in. It was returned down the flank with interest and heavy topspin. She threw her arm out in a vain attempt to reach the ball. Her ankle gave way in the chalk line, she flailed and took a fall. She lay there crumpled, another point lost, her dignity gone. The whole world was watching, and yet she had no one. He had been told that any physical contact with the players was banned. He didn't care though, as he walked over and took her hand. He held her gently up onto her feet. He walked her sobbing to her net side sea. He dried the brown eyes of the girl from Peru and whispered softly, I believe in you. The words that he whispered to her, she didn't understand. But she had felt something when he had touched her hand. It was like the gentle touch of rain on a dormant desert flower. She had felt his love, and now she felt her own power. Back on the court, she bent over and picked up the ball. And when she stood up, she felt about 30 foot tall. She was in trouble though. She had three match points to face. And for the first time in 10 days, she hit an ace. The boy was in trouble too. 
he had touched a player. The match referee cast him an incandescent glare. It was a look that said that this would be his last game. And he would never ever be this close to the girl again. She served that game out without making a single mistake. She went on to win that set on the tie break. Her serves were gathering speed now and she was bossing the net. She powered her way to a 5-0 lead in the third set. 89 minutes gone now and the match was nearly won. Just one more point with her and his time was done. She was at the height of her game, he at the depth of his despair. A single tear rolled down his cheek as she tossed the ball in the air. He realized as he watched the girl that he could never be part of her world. Would never kiss her, touch her, ease her pain. Or even take her hand in his again. It was the last thing that the boy wished to see. And it was the fastest female serve in history. 130 miles per hour, the scoreboard read. And it flew straight into the ball boy's head. The boy was polaxed, he crumpled. The on-site doctor was unable to bring him around. The medics rushed him to the ICU. The consultants doubted that he would But one week later, much to their considerable surprise, the nurse saw the boy blinking his eyes. Three days later, the boy was even sitting up in bed. Nothing short of a miracle, the doctors said. The boy asked the doctors about the girl. Apparently, she was now ranked seventh in the world. She was narrowly beaten in the semis five days ago and was already training for her next match in Tokyo. Their worlds had intersected for one glorious moment that bright June day. Now, she was 6,000 miles and a universe away. He knew, oh he knew, that what he aspired for was far too much. But he had wanted just one more turn. His recovery complete, he prepared to leave his bed. The nurse rather tactlessly told him he should be dead. They had even told his family that they should start to prepare for the end. But it had all changed after a visit by his Spanish friend. She had come to him three days ago, in the dead of night. She had taken his hand in hers and she had held it tight. She had put her mouth to his ear and whispered quietly. Some words in Spanish. Yo creo en ti. The boy was shaking, he asked to see an English Spanish dictionary. He found the words that pulled him through, and they were I.